Well, thank you for having me. First off, it's excellent to be here uh, among such a big group of, of conservationists. Uh, it's fantastic that there's so many people that are still enthusiastic uh, about wildlife and about the outdoors, uh, even when we're going through what we're going through at the moment. So it's a real pleasure to be invited here, I have to say. Uh, and I'm going to be delivering a short workshop on reptile identification, their ecology, and the best way to survey for those reptiles. And I've kind of tailored this to the Wanstead area as well. Uh, so we're only really going to cover reptiles that you might find uh, in that area. I'm just going to turn off, um, or Tony, if you could do this for me, if you could turn off the enter and exit chime when people come in, because I don't have a pair of headphones. So I'm just a bit worried about feedback. So I'm just going to give you a short introduction of frog life. Um, so I work for Frog Life and we're a national wildlife conservation charity. And we have a real focus on amphibians and reptiles. And we primarily do this in three different ways. Uh, we get involved in a lot of practical habitat management. We do a lot of educational workshops and training. That's probably the one area we really uh, focus on. And we also do a small amount of research as well. Uh, so we have been doing research on toads and how they migrate to their breeding ponds and the effect that rogues have on their population. And at the moment, we're doing a little bit of research on adders in the country as well. The Discovering Reptiles project is a two year project. And without going into too much detail, um, what we really want to deliver is we want to give people the ability to identify reptiles in their local areas. And we want to, them to be able to feel confident uh, to submit that data to us. So we really want to encourage participants uh, to undertake reptile surveys in their area. And we use a, a phone app uh, for that. We call it Dragon Finder. And it's just, if you're familiar with iRecord, similar to that in that you can submit records and they come directly to us. And then that helps us uh, deliver things like habitat management, things like research, uh, in all the right areas and really secure the long-term future of uh, reptiles in this country. So we're going to start the, the workshop with a uh, reptile identification and I'm just going to focus on the common or widespread species that you're going to find uh, here in the UK but these are the ones that you're most likely to find on Wanstead and it's the first three that I'm confident that you might find. So how to identify them? We're going to start off with the common or viviparous lizard. So you can see a number of images on your screen. And the common lizard is about 13 to 15 centimeters. So you can see it fits relatively comfortable in your hand. But the coloration is really varied. You can see here in this top left hand image, you've got black, you've got yellow, you've got even dull green. This one in the middle right, a bit more bronze, even golden. And then this one at the bottom, mottled brown and yellow. They're very different in coloration, but they usually have some shade of brown. Now you do get melanistic individuals and melanistic individuals just look black more often than not. It's when they have this over proliferation of color pigment and it just appears black. So they kind of look like this. This isn't a melanistic individual in the top image here. This is actually a juvenile. So when they're born, they're born very dark, almost black. And as they grow older, they grow into their adult coloration. But you do get a lot of their uh, black melanistic individuals in common lizards. Now common lizards can be quite difficult to tell apart in terms of sex. So the males and females, sometimes you can do it and sometimes you can't. And there's a few things you can look out for. And the first thing I would look out for is this stripe down the center. And this is called a vertebral line. And in this image here on the right, we have a female and the line is relatively unbroken. And down her back, and down the dorsolateral stripes, you don't get many dots and flecks of color. So you've got this almost unbroken line with very little spots. And if you look at this male here in the top right, this vertebral line is broken up into 
well, it's just broken up into quite a few places. There's a few more dots of color. And it's the same on this individual in the bottom right here. So this is another male where you've got this line that's broken up in places and lots of dots, lots of spots of color. That's one way you can tell the males and females apart. The other way is to check the base of the tail. So around here, the males will develop a bulge, particularly during the breeding season, which is around March and April. So you can see a bulge there. You can't quite see the bulge here on this top image, but if we take a look at this image here in the middle right, there's no bulge at the base of the tail. So the females have no bulge and the males have a bulge. That's a few, a couple of ways you can try and tell the difference. Now the main culprit you might misidentify the common lizard as is a newt, uh, particularly what we refer to as a small newt. So some of you may notice I've not talked about this image in the bottom left. This is a small newt here. And there's a few ways you can tell the difference between a common lizard and a newt. And the first thing I would do is try and approach it. And if it scuttles off very quickly, giving you absolutely no chance uh, to, to capture it and pick it up, it's a newt. So, sorry, if it does run off, it's a, it's a common lizard. And if it stays there, stays put, it's a newt. Newts, when they're on land, are very slow and very sluggish, uh, and they're not very agile whatsoever. They might try and move off, but they're not going to do it uh, in a quick way. But you can tell as well from these images, all of these lizards have scales. So take a look at the skin. You should be able to see each individual scale if you get close enough. And newts don't have scales. They have smooth skin. And if it's dry and they're on land, it can appear quite velvety, like it does in this image. But if they've just come out of water and they're wet, it will appear very smooth and slick. And if you're still a little bit confused and you manage to get close enough, count the front toes. So the front toes of a newt should number four. And if you take a look here, common lizards actually have five front toes. So moving on uh, to a slow worm. So one of everybody's favorite facts is that slow worms are legless lizards, but they do superficially look like snakes. So they were once lizards, and then over time they evolve uh, to lose their legs. And they're much, much bigger than the common lizard at around 35 and 40 centimeters. And the main key identifying feature of the slow worm is this smooth, glossy skin. And you can see it across all of these pictures here. Each one has this smooth skin. So they still have scales, but it's smooth and it's not, they're not raised like the common lizard. And it will quite often have the sheen to it as well. There's also very little distinction between the head and the body. They almost just look like a very thick sort of tube. And when we move on to the snake species, you'll be able to see very clearly uh, the distinction between the, the head and the body. Now it's a bit easier to tell the difference between the males and the females uh, when it comes to slow worms. So this bottom image here is a male. And it's usually this sort of uniform brown or gray. And every now and again, you'll get these blue flecks all down the length of the body. So if you see these blue flecks on a slow worm, it is definitely a male. So not all males develop this blue flecking, but if you do see it, it's always a male. And the females tend to look a bit more bronze or golden, and they'll usually have these dark flanks. So you can see here where my mouse is running, that they've got these really dark flanks on either side of the body. And then on top of the body, they've got these very broken, thin, dark lines that run all the way down to the tail as well. And then this is a juvenile here in the right hand side, and they look sort of similar to the, the females, uh, but they've got almost black flanks in comparison. And they usually have this single black vertebral line as well. And the juveniles are very, very small. They're only about four centimeters in length, very, very thin, very skinny. And if you do get to watch them for long enough uh, and you're unsure whether it's a snake or a slow worm, uh, take a look at its eyes. 
and you'll see that a slow worm will inevitably blink every now and again, whereas a snake does not. A snake does not have eyelids, it has a fixed lens uh, and it cannot blink. So we're moving on to the snake species now. Uh, and I believe someone's told me you do get these uh, in once they're flat. Uh, and it's the grass snake, or as I've called it here, the barred grass snake. And I'm not going to go into any detail on this, so you can ask me at the end if you're interested. But we reclassified our grass snake species uh, in 2018 to a full species status to what we now call the barred grass snake. But the majority of people still call it a grass snake, and I still think that's completely acceptable to do so. So the adults can be big. This is why I said they still produce this wow factor. If you've never seen a grass snake and you see one for the first time, uh, you, you might be taken aback at how big they can get. So on average, they're around 60 to 100 centimeters. The females can grow up to a meter and a half. And it is rare because they are predated upon by things like foxes and domestic cats. Uh, and when they're smaller, they'll be taken by things like birds of prey and herons. But if they do get to, to grow old, they can grow up to about a metre and a half. And their coloration is usually this sort of green or dark olive colour. And again, I want to sort of hammer in the, the key identifying feature of each species. And for the grass snakes, it's this yellow collar behind the head. If you see a yellow collar behind the head of a snake in this country, it's always going to be a grass snake. It's not going to be anything else. That's what you really want to look out for, because you, you might just see it for a few seconds uh, before it whizzes off into the undergrowth. If you manage to spot that yellow collar, you know for sure that it's a grass snake. And again, telling the difference between the males and the females can be quite difficult, uh, but there are a few things that you can do. And what you do want to do is, is look at either end. So on the females, and this is a female we have here in the top left, the body tapers off into the tail very quickly. So you can see she's got a very thick set body and then it gets very thin, very skinny, very quickly. You know, from around about here, I would say. So females have very short tails. So snakes do have tails. And technically to identify where the body ends and the tail begins, you'd have to flip the snake over and identify where the vent is. But you can sort of tell looking from a bird's eye perspective, that it starts about here. And if we have a look at the male here on the right hand side, that tapers off far more gradually. Uh, and, you, you, and in fact, I can't tell where the body actually <laughs> stops and the tail begins. And at the other end as well, if you look at the head, the females have very big, thick necks. So you can see where the body joins the head, it juts out very suddenly. And on the males, it's far more gradual. So the, uh, the males are far more tube-like. They're more like spaghetti than the females. The females have very short tails and very bulky heads, where the males have very skinny tails and very skinny heads. And as well as this yellow collar, uh, you can tell it's a grass snake from these dark flanks. So these dark bars on their flanks, sorry. So it's really obvious here on this individual, if you can see my mouse cursor, these dark bars down the flanks, this is what gives it its name uh, here in the UK, the barred grass snake. In other populations of grass snake in Europe, they tend not to have these bars, at least not in Western Europe. Um, it's the, these bars that really identify it as the barred grass snake. Now you may confuse the grass snake with our other widespread species, the adder. Uh, and if you are confused and you get to witness the snake for long enough, take a look at the eyes. And a grass snake has these round pupils, circular pupils with this yellow iris. I'm going to move on to adder here, and you probably won't see these in one stead, but it's not impossible. Very improbable, but not impossible. If you take a look at the adder eye, you can see it's got these very frightening bright red irises with these vertical pupils. It's a very cool looking eye. It's almost as if it's staring straight into you, saying, don't, don't come near me. Uh, I will bite you, and I am venomous. They are a venomous snake, whereas they don't bite very often uh, unless they're disturbed and they need to be very wound up to bite you. Um, 
they are venomous. But I've included this because I've had reports that there are adders uh, in a place called The Chase in Dagenham, which isn't a million miles away from Wanstead, and they've been spotted there for the first time, I think, you know, since we've held records. Um, it's probably got there by using the, the, the overground railway lines, and it's probably a male uh, that's looking for a female. So I doubt it's ever going to establish a breeding population there. But it's not impossible that an adder may turn up uh, somewhere in Wanstead because the males can get around. But they're a smaller snake than the grass snake. They're around 60 to 80 centimetres. And they're very stocky in comparison. They're very thick set, stubby snake. And the main identifying feature of the adder is this zigzag pattern that runs down the length of the body. And you can see it on all of the adders here, this zigzag pattern. And this helps identify the sex as well. So this is a female we've got here in the bottom left. And they tend to be a sort of light brown or bronze color with a dark brown zigzag. And males tend to be a grayish color with a black zigzag. So males will always have a black zigzag. So if you ever see a snake with a dark brown zigzag, it will be a female. But that's how you usually tell the difference between the sexes. So dull grey and black zigzag for male. And a light brown with a dark brown zigzag for female. And this is a juvenile we've got here in the top right. And they tend to be this gingery red colour with a sort of gingery zigzag pattern as well. OK, so hopefully you've got a bit of a bit of an idea of how to identify different reptiles. Um, so that was two lizard species and two snake species. And we're just going to go over a few of the general threats uh, to these species and why our reptiles really aren't faring well um, in this country. And the biggest one, and this is a big one for, for biodiversity in general, uh, is the loss and degradation of habitat. And the thing that's hit reptiles the hardest uh, is the loss of heathland. So we've lost between 80 and 90% of our heathland since I think the 1800s. And heathland provides everything a reptile might ever need in its lifetime. Um, and in fact, if you want to see all of our native reptiles in one place in this country, you tend to have to visit heathland uh, in the south of England. But changes to our agriculture and forestry, uh, and certainly un unsympathetic management as well uh, to places that reptiles do uh, exist has meant that we've lost a lot of our reptiles. And the fragmentation of the habitat that is suitable for reptiles probably hits them harder than most other species. So if we think of roads and urban areas splitting up areas of habitat, um, that's, what we, that's what we would consider fragmentation. And reptiles don't colonize new areas very well at all. Adders in particular do not like to move from place to place and most reptiles are very loyal to their uh, hibernaculars. Um, they will go back to hibernate in the same areas again and again and again, year after year, and uh, they do struggle to colonise areas that don't have uh, populations of, of reptiles within them. And particularly for adders, again, you get genetic depression where there's just so few individuals um, that the, the gene pool is so small, they start having a lot of problems. And in fact, 90% of all our adders, all our adder populations in the UK number less than 10, and they're at severe risk of, of genetic depression because of this. But you also get predation from domestic cats as well. Uh, so certainly in urban areas uh, where you get a lot of slow worms and you also get a lot of domestic cats, uh, domestic cats will predate on them and they'll predate them to the point that they just won't persist within that environment anymore. And if you do want to attract slow worms to your garden by having compost heaps and suitable habitat, if you do have a lot of domestic cats uh, in that area, you probably won't be successful. And then to a lesser degree than and particularly any of the habitat threats I've spoken about, there's the persecution. Uh, snakes are given a bad reputation um, some people still think they're very dangerous. 
And in fact, adders are the only dangerous hyphen, um, sorry, uh, uh, thingy marks snake because um, they are venomous. But we've only ever had 14 deaths of adders uh, in this country. Um, the, the bites are very treatable and they bite so rarely. They're a very secretive, very cryptic snake. Um, and with just a little bit of interpretation on the sites that they exist at, uh, you can avoid all the bites to humans, I would say, and most bites to dogs. So the dogs that get bitten are usually the ones that are off the lead. And dogs by nature are very curious and they're going to be batting, they're going to be sniffing uh, the, the adder, and that's when the adder's going to bite them. It's very rare to, to actually uh, have an, an adder bite a human. And reptile disease as well. Uh, if you're interested, do visit this website. We do have something called snake fungal infection in this country that is a problem in the US, but hasn't been much of a problem here in the UK, but we do want to keep track of it. And this, uh, this website here will lead you to an organization that are very good at identifying uh, the spread of these sorts of uh, reptile diseases and amphibian diseases as well. Okay, so what conservation measures can you take? Uh, and this is great for a volunteer, volunteer group like yourselves, uh, that I imagine do a lot of volunteer work um, around the Wanstead area. In fact, uh, off topic fact, I did a very small stint with Epping Forest as a forest keeper uh, back in 2016, I think it was. Uh, and I have to say, they didn't do much other than drive around in their cars uh, around Wanstead. Um, but a team like that could do some great conservation work uh, for very little, I have to say. Um, so we'll go over some of those things that you can do as a voluntary group and that you can encourage um, the land managers and the landowners to, to take part in. And certainly for grass snakes, uh, which are only one of two of the egg laying reptiles native to this country, you can provide egg laying sites. So an egg laying site is just something that's gonna be warmer in the center than any of its surrounding environment. So we're talking big piles of brash, rotting vegetation. The number one thing that you could do uh, for bad grass snakes on your site is a pile of manure. Manure is perfect for grass snakes to lay their eggs in. Now you're gonna have a hard time convincing any land manager to do that, particularly on a site that has a lot of public, uh, some public interest, a lot of people walking through it. If you do manage it, that is the number one best thing you can do uh, for bad grass snakes. And then by identifying and protecting where uh, reptiles hibernate, you're gonna do a lot of work in helping them persist and spread to other areas as well. Um, because this is, this is one of the things that reptiles really like to do. They will just go back to their hibernation sites again and again and again. And if you know where that is, and you can protect it from public disturbance, uh, from dismantling, so we have a love of just making things look very neat and pretty in this country. And um, so if you know that our reptiles are in a, an, a messy looking pile of vegetation, uh, by identifying that and making sure it doesn't get cleared away, it's gonna do a world of wonder uh, for our reptiles. Uh, and limiting the areas reptiles use for basking, from mowing or grazing. So reptiles like to bask, and we'll move on to to that in a few minutes uh, and where they are basking making sure it's not being mown certainly early in the year is going to be a really positive step to take for encouraging reptiles on your sites and then any areas you have really dense scrub or woodland opening up certain patches so that reptiles can use those areas for basking in certain thermal regulation is going to be useful and then if you can, just limiting public disturbance from anywhere you know reptiles are very active. A little bit of public disturbance is gonna be fine, um, but getting continuously disturbed really bothers reptiles. And if they do get continuously disturbed when they're basking early in the day, uh, and when they are using their, their hibernation sites, it's gonna be very detrimental. Okay, so we're gonna move on to sort of reptile ecology. Uh, and the life cycles of, of reptiles. I'm not quite sure how, how long I've, I've got Tony, so do just chime in uh, when I, I'm running out of time and I'll make sure I wrap up.
in an orderly manner. You've got plenty of time. Carry on. Good. Um, so to understand how to survey for reptiles, it's really good to know what their seasonal life cycles are like because uh, we're limited by when they're active, really, as to, as to how and when we can survey for them. And they do differ a little bit uh, between each of the species, uh, but they generally follow the same pattern. So we'll, we'll go over the common lizard first. And in February or March, the common lizard is going to leave their, their hibernation site. And then in March or April, that's when they're going to start breeding. And they're really easy to see uh, during this time of the year, I think, because the males can be seen fighting for priority to these um, good basking sites. So they'll, they'll be seen battling each other. Uh, and they're both trying to bask as much as possible uh, to really raise their body condition uh, to make sure they're, they're in the best breeding condition possible. And in April or August, you'll see the females are noticeably swollen. They get, and this is a, a picture here of a swollen female. And this is because they incubate their eggs internally. So another, another name for the common lizard is viviparous lizard, which just viviparous just means giving birth. Uh, so giving birth to live young. So they still um, sort of incubate in an egg inside the female. But when she does give birth in April or August, they are live. They, they, they're out of their egg and they're able to move immediately. And they bask during this period uh, to give their eggs the best chance of incubating uh, correctly. And then they give birth to around four to 11 young in July or August. So the older and the bigger the female, the more young she is likely to produce. And then in August or October, uh, you'll find a lot of activity in most reptiles because they're trying to feed as much as possible before they go back uh, into hibernation. And common lizards tend to feed on fast moving invertebrate prey. So they'll spot something and they'll quickly scuttle over towards it, something like a spider, and then they'll shake their, their, their prey really vigorously to stun it because it can take them a while to get it down their throats. Um, and it's really cool. They're, they're actually one of my favourite um, reptiles to sort of watch when they're hunting, just because they look quite animated when they're shaking their prey around. And then between October and March, most reptiles and the, you know, the common lizard uh, are going to be overwintering anywhere that has a stable temperature. And that's really what they're looking for. They're looking for somewhere that isn't going to freeze over winter. So very thick, big piles of dead wood or leaf litter or brash. They like going underground. Underground freezes um, a lot more difficultly than, you know, on top of the ground. So in old stonework or old Marlboros are really good places uh, for reptiles to sort of overwinter. Uh, so we're just going to have a look at some of the common lizard habitat you might find them in uh, and sort of what their behavioural, some of their behaviours. Um, you, you do get them everywhere. Uh, so I don't know if, if anyone has seen them on Wanstead Flats before. I would certainly like to know if anyone has seen them before, uh, after the, the workshop. Um, but they're found in most habitats in the UK. Grassland, heathland, moorland, farmland that isn't too intensively farmed. Uh, but they, they do tend to be found anywhere that doesn't flood regularly. So they are found on wetlands, uh, but reptiles don't survive very well if they're um, hibernation sites flood. So for that reason, common lizards are found more often on places that don't flood. And they're usually a ground dweller. So when you see them, they're usually on the ground. But you can see here they're, they're on top of some drift fencing. And they will climb up uh, to wherever they can get to the sunniest, warmest patch available to them. So they do just like open sunny areas. Anywhere that's exposed and gets a lot of direct sunshine is a really good place that you might see a common lizard. I mentioned they, they tend to feed on fast moving insects and spiders. Uh, and another cool thing, I'm not sure if they think it's cool, uh, but they can drop their tail when they're attacked. So if a predator actually grasps the tail uh, of a common lizard, it will detach completely 
and it will wriggle around quite vigorously for a couple of minutes uh, as the, the common lizard makes a bit of a speedy getaway. Um, and it's for this reason I would maybe suggest if you're not very familiar with handling common lizards, best to leave them alone and just uh, observe them from a distance. Because if, if you do catch one and you touch its tail and it doesn't take much at all, uh, it will completely drop off. And whereas the tail does grow back, uh, it doesn't really grow back to the same sort of stature as the old tail. And I imagine it takes a lot of resources to do so. So it's not great for the common lizard. Okay, so slow worms briefly go over their seasonal life cycle because it's very similar to the common lizards. Uh, so they tend to leave a little bit later, maybe around March, not usually as early as February. Uh, and the males tend to leave earlier. The males tend to leave earlier in all the species because they want to uh, either fight other males for priority to females and they want to get uh, their body condition up so they look spectacular for the females. The males will fight each other for access to the females around April to May. And in June or September, you'll see that the females also incubate their, their young inside, just like the um, common lizards. And again, they're very swollen. And they can give birth up to 25 young in August or September. Uh, and if you are doing a reptile survey, um, if you're looking under things like refugia or stones or big wooden logs, and the, you see slow worms, you'll quite often see huge groups of them, sort of, you know, dozens and dozens of juvenile slow worms all together, all tangled up like slow worm spaghetti. But they do tend to be found under refugia. They aren't seen basking uh, in the same manner that common lizards are. They're very, very rarely out in the open. So you do need to be looking out for slow worms underneath things. And again, they overwinter between October and March. Anywhere that has that void space with a stable temperature. So anywhere that isn't going to freeze over. Found in very similar habitats to common lizards, uh, with one small difference. They are the species you're most likely to encounter in urban areas. Uh, so I'm assuming most people are joining us from uh, London, which I would consider a very big urban area. Uh, and I imagine slow worms are very, are probably the most populous of the reptiles in, in the wider London area, uh, because they will exist very happily in compost heaps, uh, in gardens or allotments, uh, and they will live there happily for up to 30 years because a compost heap provides them everything they might ever need. They don't need basking areas like other reptiles do. They will just sit on top of a compost heap, which is gonna be quite warm, uh, all that rotting vegetation underneath it, all that heat's gonna to rise to the top, uh, and they'll quite happily sit in a, in a compost heap, um, thermoregulating and then catching all the slugs and snails that all that rotting vegetation is going to attract. And they can drop their tails, uh, just like the common lizard. So they are a lizard species, so they do drop their tails. So even though it looks like they're just one big long body, they do have a tail uh, and they drop it very, very easily, probably more easily than common lizard. Um, so again, if you're unfamiliar with how to handle a slow worm, avoid it because you will, will cause them to drop their tails. The bar grass snake is going to leave hibernation around March or April. So probably even later than the, than the slow worm and definitely later than the common lizard. Again, the males are going to be looking to, to leave hibernation earlier. They do this to, you know, shed their, their first skin of the year uh, and to aid in sort of things like sperm production. Uh, they really just want to give themselves a head start over other males so that they can breed with the females as soon as they emerge. And you get these things called mating balls uh, with grass snakes. So the males don't fight each other for priority over the females. What they'll do is they'll form a mating ball, which is kind of a, sounds really disgusting. And I've never seen one, but I imagine it looks a little bit disgusting as well. I mean, it'd be fascinating to see it, but it's where you get many males all competing at once for access to the female. And they create this sort of snaky tangleweed uh, called a mating ball. And I think you can get dozens of males all at once trying to gain access to the female. 
And um, it's usually the biggest male that gains access to the female. So the biggest male will fight off, well, or at least attract the female uh, to allow the mating rights. And then in June or July, the females are going to be laying their eggs so they don't incubate their eggs like uh, the lizard species. They will lay their eggs in rotting vegetation or manure piles, anywhere that has a, quite a warm, stable temperature in comparison to the surrounding environment. And you'll, you tend to see less activity from the adults during this, this season as well. So June, July and August is actually quite a poor time to see reptiles. Uh, we'll get on to why that is in the next few slides. You get the second peak of activity in, in most reptiles and definitely grass snakes in August or September when they're looking to feed as much as possible uh, to put on those calories to make sure they last throughout the winter. And the barred grass snake is generally a lowland species. You tend not to find them very often in northern England and they're particularly rare, I would say, in Scotland. So I think the adder is probably a more common species in Scotland uh, than the grass snake. And grass snakes can be found uh, in farmland, grassland, heathland, moorland, but they do have an affinity for water. So wherever you do find them, they tend to be around water. And this is because they're amphibian specialists. They do like to uh, hunt and feed on frogs and newts, and they can be seen actively hunting them as well. So you'll quite often see them in ponds, swimming around, uh, looking for frogs. But as they get older, they will also take small mammals, fish and birds as well. Uh, although this is far rarer uh, than them taking amphibians. So they are a non-venomous snake. Uh, their defensive mechanism, if handled <laughs> or if caught by a predator, is to sort of emit this nasty smelling liquid from their anal glands and then they will actually thrash their tail around it's trying to spread it about and if you've ever smelled this before what it reminds me of is sort of rotting flesh that's really what it smells like to me and they'll quite often play dead when they do this as well so i think what they're trying to do here is signal to their, their predator i've been dead a while i smell nasty don't consume me or i'm gonna I'm gonna make you quite ill uh, but if you ever do want to handle a grass snake, that is the price you're going to have to pay. You'll have to get this, this nasty musk all over your hands. And if females will lay up to 10 to 40 eggs, and they'll quite often uh, do this communally as well. So there are only going to be a few egg laying sites uh, within the vicinity of, of wherever there is a population of, of grass snakes. So quite often you'll see many hundreds of eggs, uh, all communally laid by a number of different females. And I just, so I've got a map, I've pulled this off the um, National Biodiversity Network. Uh, this is a map of the records we have uh, of all reptiles since records <laughs> began uh, that the NBN currently hold. And you can see how sparse it is. Uh, so we've got maybe a record up here, uh, it looks like on Lee Valley land. We've actually got a single record here on Wanstead Flats. A single record here and a few other records here. Uh, but you can see how sparse the records are for reptiles. Uh, and I'm, I'm sharing this with you now because I'm going to move on to how to survey for the reptiles uh, and why it's so important. One of the reasons it's so important is we have such a paucity of data <laughs> we really, really need people to just submit their sightings to us. Um, okay, I thought I was gonna do the, the survey methods first, but I'm gonna, it looks like I've interspersed an identification quiz first. Um, so let's see if you can, before we get on to moving on, yeah, moving on to the surveying, I guess you need to be able to identify your reptiles. Maybe that was my logic behind this. Uh, so I'm gonna start a poll. So a poll is going to pop up on your screen and I want you to try and uh, identify the reptile. So I'm going to give you about 10 to 20 seconds. Uh, you'll see a reptile on your screen and just vote for what reptile you think it is. Okay, so this is the first time I've ever run a poll. So let's hope this goes smoothly. Okay. 
Okay, so poll should pop up on your screen. You can drag it to the left-hand side if it covers the image. But uh, take a look at what you see on the screen. Remember the identifying features I was talking about and then cast your vote. Ben, can I just check you can see the results? Because I can. Yep, I can see the results. Okay. And I will be sharing the results as well with everybody once I've got most of the votes in. Okay, so most of you have voted, so I'm gonna end it there. And most of you were, were right here. So this is an adder. So hopefully you saw this zigzag pattern down the length of the body as well. And you can actually, I would say this is a male adder as well. So that isn't an option on the, on the poll, uh, but it's got this black zigzag pattern with this dull sort of gray body color. So I would probably quite confidently say that was a male adder. Okay, so moving on to number two, cast your votes. Okay, I'm gonna end it there. And great to see most of you identified this as a common lizard. So you can see it's got limbs. In fact, it's the only lizard, common lizard species you'll see with limbs, uh, particularly in the Wanstead area. Uh, but you can see that it's got scales down the length of its body. Uh, it doesn't have that smooth skin that a small newt might have. Uh, and you, you can't see, too much else, you can't see its vertebral line, uh, but it's the scales that really give it away as a common lizard and not a small newt. Okay, so number three. And I'll just take this opportunity as well to sort of um, talk about the other reptiles you might find uh, in this country as well. So there are a number of non-native species uh, that you'll find uh, that I haven't covered uh, in this sort of presentation. Um, but there are two other native species as well, but they're very rare and very localized. So you probably won't find them uh, in the London area. In fact, I know you won't find them in the London area. Let's just end this poll here. And the majority of, got, of you have got this as a slow worm, which is fantastic. So hopefully you saw this smooth, shiny skin. So you can see the scales on um, all of our other reptile species, actually. So grass snake, adder, and the common lizard. It's just the smooth snake that has this smooth, glossy skin. But it's quite a, an obscured image, so I can see why some of you may have been a bit confused but it does have these dark flanks that you can see here. So these solid dark flanks, which give it away as a female slow worm. Okay, moving on to number four. And the non-native um, sort of reptile species that you may find in the Wanstead area are most likely going to be uh, one of the two turtle species or terrapins as a, they're sort of fondly known as, as so you get red-eared terrapins, I think, quite often in London. Uh, and I will almost definitely assume you get them in the Wanstead area because they're, they're quite prevalent throughout all of London. Um, and you get European pond turtles as well. So they are non-native species uh, to the UK. They have been introduced here, but I haven't included them in this presentation. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, loads of you got this as a small new. So this is this is the one question I get a lot is usually how do I tell if it's a newt or a lizard? And it looks like most people here have been able to tell that this is a, a small newt. So it's got 
it looks like it's just come out of water, or at least it's, it's slightly damp and wet. It's got shiny, smooth skin uh, and no scales. It's definitely a small newt. Okay, number five. And the other two native reptiles that we have uh, that you that I haven't shown any pictures of during this presentation is the sand lizard and the smooth snake. And they're very, very highly protected now uh, because we just don't have many of them left in this country, uh, particularly the smooth snake. Uh, you'll only find the smooth snake on three southern counties of England, uh, I think. And you, you really only get them in very mature heathland areas. Uh, you won't find them anywhere in London. And then the sand lizard you either get on heathland in the south of England, but in the west of England, you'll get them on coastal sand dunes as well. Great, so most of you got this as the adder again. So again, it's the adder that has this zigzag pattern that runs down the length of the body. You won't find that on the grass snake. The grass snake has this yellow collar behind the back of the head. That's, that's the grass snake's identifying feature. And the adder has this zigzag pattern. Okay, what about this one? Uh, still on sort of a non-native species. You'll find a few of the non-native lizards and snakes throughout the country, but again, they, they're, they're very localized uh, and you're unlikely to see them in London, uh, but you might do. But I would, I would always assume if you see something and you're unsure as to what it is, that, it, that it's one of the, the common or widespread species that I've covered today. That will make up the majority of all reptile sightings across uh, the UK. Fantastic. So most of you got this as slow worm again. So hopefully you saw that smooth skin. You cannot see any individual scales. Uh, and if you're observant, you may have seen these very, very sort of subtle, small and subtle blue specks on its body, giving it away as a male slow worm. Again, this is how subtle it can be sometimes in the males. They don't always develop that vibrant blue flecking that I showed earlier. Okay, we're on to the second last one. Cast your votes. Okay, so fantastic. Most of you have got this as grass snake. So hopefully you can just see that yellow collar sort of quite blurred in the background there. But it's this dark sort of, well, it's actually quite light olive colour. It has these dark bars running down the length of the flanks, which gives it away as a grass snake. This is the final one. Ben, we, we've got about five minutes till the half past mark. Okay, I, yeah, I'll finish up uh, after we've done this ID quiz. Right, so most of you have got this as a common lizard, which is correct. So you can see the individual scales that the common lizard has that you won't find on the small newt. And if I had to guess as well, I would probably say this was a female. I can't see any bulge at the base of the tail. It doesn't look too spotty and flecky down its back. And that vertebral line is fairly unbroken. It is broken in a few places. Um, so I 
wouldn't perhaps say I was confident in, in naming this a female. That's that would be my best guess. Uh, so well done, everybody. I think the, I think between sort of eighty and ninety percent. Uh, we're getting correct answers every time, so that's really, really good to see. Uh, and I'm just going to fi finish up with a plug on surveying for reptiles. So I won't go. I, I don't have time really to go over uh, how to do it. But basically, what I was going to cover was how to do a visual survey. And if I had to distill that into one line, it's look at habitat interfaces. So you want to be looking at where scrub slowly goes into grassland or where woodland edge slowly transitions to, to scrub. And it's where one habitat transitions into another that you're most likely going to see reptiles basking. And a visual survey is just having a nice jolly around your local area and seeing whether you can find any reptiles whilst you're at it. And if you do, please do download our Dragon Finder app it's a really nifty little app that will help you identify amphibians and reptiles. Uh, but its primary function is for you to be able to submit your sightings to us. Um, so this data does come directly to us, uh, which makes it easier for us to, to base our work on. Uh, but we do submit this data to the National Biodiversity Network as well. And any local record centre or organisation uh, that would like some of the data for a particular area, uh, can get in touch with us too and we're always happy to share that uh, but you can download this on uh, android devices and apple devices you just type in dragon finder to the, the app store uh, and it's really intuitive to use you just report your sighting that data gets sent off to us uh, and it really helps us identify where we can deliver our best work so please do download the app Go out to your local spaces. Uh, so it'd be great if we start seeing some data coming from, from the Wanstead area. Try to do maybe two or four surveys uh, a year. Any time between sort of late April and to July are gonna yield you the best results as to, to what you're gonna see and the likelihood of you seeing it. And hopefully you'll now be able to identify uh, those reptiles and sort of send the data to us confidently. I just finally thank you to the uh, lottery, National Lottery Heritage Fund uh, who have funded this project. Uh, it's a fantastic little project. I'm glad they're funding it. Um, couldn't do it without their help. Do we have any questions? Uh, Tony, have you been keeping track of the questions in chat or are we taking questions from sort of people speaking over the microphone first? I time? have indeed and we, we can do both. I'm just <laughs> going to pause the recording for a moment. To actually undertake a reptile visual survey and this is probably the hardest if you ever want to become a sort of reptile uh, enthusiast or a reptile oncologist this is really what you need to train yourself to be able to do because they're a very cryptic species they don't want to be seen and it's very hard to establish presence of reptiles you know it's not like butterflies where they you know on a nice warm day uh, they're going to be out in their full glory and usually very easy to see. Reptiles are once going to remain hidden and you need to train yourself to be able to see exactly where they are. So before we get into the, the details, uh, I just want to touch briefly on thermoregulation uh, because understanding how reptiles do this makes it far easier to exploit their behaviour uh, for surveying. And thermoregulation is just the process by which any species manages their own temperature. And reptiles are ectothermic, so they use their environment to thermoregulate. So in sort of contrast to, to us humans, uh, we're endothermic, we use internal processes uh, to heat ourselves up, to cool ourselves down. Uh, primarily, I mean, we still use our environment to thermoregulate as well, but our bodies can internally regulate our temperatures whereas reptiles do not. So their preferred temperature range is around 25 to 30 centigrade. And to get themselves up to that preferred temperature, they usually bask in direct sunshine. 
but they'll also use items in their environment that retain heat as well. And it's also worth noting that they will use their environment to cool down as well. So when the, the ambient temperature is really warm, they're going to be above that preferred temperature range. They're going to be using uh, their, their local habitat uh, to cool down as well as heat up. And adders and common lizards are really, really good at thermoregulation. And it's why we find populations of them so far north. So adders are a very successful snake. They're found all across uh, the the northern hemisphere, particularly in the, the western northern hemisphere, um, because they're that thick, stocky snake that can flatten their body, so they increase their surface area really quite well, and they get, they're get they very good at using the heat of their environment. Common lizards are good at that as well, because they're able to flatten their bodies, so they can take up heat from things that have already absorbed um, warmth from the sun, but also increasing their surface area. Okay, so moving on to the, the meat of, of surveying. When is it best to do it? So cast your minds back to when reptiles uh, were active. So they're starting to come out of hibernation around February and they're starting to go back into hibernation around October. So you can do a survey anywhere between February to October. But your best bet is to do it between March and May. So you've got this peak of activity in March and May when they're all coming out of hibernation. They're all wanting to breed. So they're very active. They're basking very readily and usually very openly. And then you get this dip of activity in the summer months in June, July and August because the ambient temperature is going to be much warmer. So they don't bask as prevalently. But then in September or October, you get the second peak where they're going to be feeding as much as possible. So they're putting on the calories to last their overwintering period. So those, those are the two sort of windows of opportunity uh, for best surveying practice. And the best times of day are usually the sort of early-ish to mid-morning when they're going to be cold. Uh, coming out of out of the night uh, and they want to be raising their temperature up as quickly as possible so they can get on with their activities for the day. But then again, when the temperature cools down in this sort of later afternoon and early evening. But this does depend on the weather. So we'll go a little bit further into this. So the best temperature is usually between 9 or 18 degrees. So that's, that tends to be when you're most likely to find reptiles out and about. So if it's far cooler than that, they're going to be out a little bit later in the morning. And if it's far warmer than that, they'll probably be out earlier. So you do have to match when you're going surveying out to what temperatures uh, you're, you're currently experiencing. And again, if it's going to remain wa very warm into the evening, they'll stay out later and later. But when you do have cooler temperatures, so when it's more like nine degrees, bright sunshine is just the best weather. So if you're thinking of going out in February and March, you want bright, direct sunshine. They won't be out on any hazy day because the amb ambient temperature just isn't going to rise high enough for them. They want that direct sunshine on their skin. It's going to heat them up as quickly as possible. They don't like basking. They're not doing it because they enjoy it. They're doing it because they want to get that temperature up uh, to that preferred range so that they can hide from predators, they can feed, they can breed. They want to bask as little as possible. So bright sunshine is best when it's cold. And on the warmer days, so anywhere that's 18 degrees or more, you want that hazy weather where there's lots of cloud, but it's really warm because they're going to be basking for a bit longer because it's going to take them longer to heat up. Now, any rain just makes it really unsuitable uh, for surveying, which is one of the best reasons to ever, you know, get involved in reptile surveying. And I imagine any butterfly enthusiast out there understand me completely. You just get to go out and have a nice, 
walk when, it, when it's when it's warm and it's sunny and you just can't do any work if it's ra raining you you have to you know you have to stay indoors uh, it's a very smart professional choice i find um, so any rain i wouldn't consider suitable surveying weather but any direct sunshine after a, a quick bout of rain is good so this is particularly suitable in april when you get a lot of you know the classic april showers a quick burst of rain that's going to cool down all the reptiles and then bright direct sunshine where they're going to come out and bask that's the only weather the, the only rainy weather i would consider suitable uh, for the surveying reptiles okay so why is, why is a visual encounter or visual survey good and in fact it's my favorite type of survey because it's just so low effort you don't need any equipment you don't even need to tell anybody that you're doing it you just make a decision that you're going to go out to that site on that day and then take a look for some reptiles it's just so simple it's it's beautiful but it does have a few pitfalls it's not so good for detecting species that don't bask so that really is just the slow worm the slow worm likes to be underneath things um, and we're not going to go into using reptile refugia now uh, but one way of getting around this is actually by using items that heat up a lot quicker in your environment that reptiles are going to use and then you'll find slow worms underneath that but there's absolutely no reason why when you're doing your visual survey you can't be looking underneath things like logs uh, any old rubbish that you find that might heat up quite nicely and you may find slow worms underneath those items um, this survey as well is completely inappropriate for determining absence so i mentioned there are a cryptic species you might go out four or five times a year to one site and never see a reptile and it might be that you were unlucky you cannot confirm absence from a visual survey and this isn't so important for um, conservationists and sort of amateur naturalists uh, this is only really professional ecologists that should not be doing visual surveys uh, because they're likely going to be doing surveys that then are, you know on, on sites that are going to be developed on um, and if there are reptiles there that's going to be really really bad news um, if you are looking to determine absence don't don't use visual encounter surveys as well as that the survey results that you do get aren't really comparable between surveyors so this ties to something we call survey effort and your surveyor is going to build up what we call survey effort and um, with how many times they go out um, how good they are at surveying how well they're able to positively id uh, their species of interest and if you're looking to build up a long-term database you, you just can't really do this if you're using different surveyors so if one person's going one week and then another person's going next week because your survey effort isn't going to be comparable and to some degree i would even argue it's difficult over time because you're just going to improve as you do more of these visual surveys you're going to be far better at finding where these reptiles are and you may see an increase of how many reptiles you see and that doesn't necessarily mean you have an increase of uh, reptiles you just might be getting better at it okay so how do you do a visual encounter what do you need to do and it really is it's just a posh word of saying going for a walk um, you want to walk relatively slowly and you want to scan ahead we'll get into where you want to be scanning ahead in the next few slides and you want to tread fairly lightly so you don't want to be bulldozing through grassland uh, they're very sensitive to ground vibrations and they will scuttle off so you do want to listen for movement and if you do think you hear something and it could have been a reptile do just take a few steps back so you're maybe two or three meters away from where you think you heard it because common lizards in particular will 90 percent of the time return to the same spot that literally the exact same spot um, they have a preference for certain places and they'll stick to those places 
uh, with rigid determination. So you can quite often find them again when you've disturbed them. And you do need to be patient. So we recommend going out two or four times a year. You may need to go out more because you just might not see them every time. So you do need to learn to love just exploring your sort of local green places and be patient because you're not going to see reptiles every time. Unless you go to the waterworks in London because they're just so abundant. And do keep your eye out for a sort of dumped refugia. You can see here in the image we've got a, um, I think this is actually a sand lizard here, uh, on a discarded old tyre. This tyre is going to heat up really nicely in comparison to its surrounding vegetation. And there's many items of dumped rubbish that do this. Keep an eye out for them. It says here, look out for mosaic basking. I've got an image of mosaic basking coming up, so you'll see exactly what that is. And these are a few of the available habitats um, here in the UK that, that reptiles do like. So I've, I've banged on about heathland and how good it is for reptiles. So you don't, I mean, I don't think you get heathland in the Wanstead area, um, but you'll get a number of these. So you may have allotments on in, in Wanstead, certainly in people's gardens. I'm not sure if it'll be on Wanstead flats. But look out for south facing banks. So in this image in the bottom right here, you've got this bank that faces south. That is just gonna be perfect for reptiles. You can see you've got woodland in the back here. You've got scrub in the front. These places are not gonna warm up. They're not gonna heat up in the same way this bank is. So this is where you want to be looking, this bank. And then the margins of habitat. So if you're walking in this field, you'd be looking down here where this longer grass meets the path. Take a note of, of these sort of habitats here. This is where you're most likely to find reptiles. This is, this is the, the training, where to look, where do you want to, to be training your gaze? Because when you're actually out there doing your reptile survey, that you just there's so much information, you really need to focus on just one or two places. And that is, that's really difficult. It's far more difficult than, than um, I'm making it sound out to be. Um, and even, even myself, when I go out for a reptile survey, particularly when I'm on Heathland, there's just so many good areas to be looking. You really need to, to understand where to look when you're out there. And this is the main one, habitat interfaces. So it's called an ecotone, where you get one habitat transitioning into another. It's that ecotone that you just wanna be scanning almost methodically. So if I was here in this image, it wouldn't be here in the middle grass that I'd be looking. It would be where this gorse meets the grass. This is exactly where you're gonna find reptiles. So I would start at one end and I would just look where the gorse or heather meets the grass. And I would continue walking up here, taking a look. And I would completely ignore anything in the middle. You're just unlikely to find anything. Always be scanning the habitat interfaces. And here on this heathland, I'd be walking up this path and I'll be looking on either side of this path where the heather meets the bare ground. I would not be going into the middle of the heather. Always a habitat interface. So I'd probably walk up here and I would maybe even consider walking along to these trees and taking a look where these trees meet this heather. It's so around about here. And any areas where you have varied height structure. It's the diversity of structure in the vegetation that allows reptiles to thermoregulate. So short stubby grassland into longer grassland, into scrub, into uh, young regenerative woodland like we've got here. And even the edges of mature woodland all great places to be looking for, for reptiles because they will use that diversity of structure to manage their body temperature. So if on your sites you just have a very undiverse area of vegetative structure that I wouldn't start there. I would go somewhere where there's lots of diversity. 
And that's, that's rarer than you might think. Uh, even our woodlands in this country have been managed so all the trees are planted at the same time and they grow up to be the same sort of heights uh, all at the same time. And that's really, really bad for biodiversity. We want a diversity of structure and a diversity of species. That's what we really want to encourage. And it's the edges of habitat. So if I was hearing this image, I'd be thinking to myself, this stonework is great for reptiles to hibernate in. I'm going to walk up along here and I'm going to check the edge of this habitat where they may have crawled out of this stonework, but they won't have gone into this, this dank vegetation here. And I'll be scanning along here, a little bit further up into the image, it looked like there might be a hedgerow. Again, if you take away one thing, it's the habitat interfaces, the edges of habitat that you want to be walking along and that you want to be checking in between. And anywhere south facing that's close to shelter. So there's south facing banks. You can just see how sunny it is here. I'd be looking along here for any reptiles maybe basking in that beautiful warm sunshine and they're going to scuttle off into that undergrowth into that scrubby vegetation should they get disturbed and this is a typical image of what you might see so all reptiles do this including lizards uh, they will only show part of their body they'll only expose a small portion of their body and i think this is just to blend in to evade certain predators. So it's not difficult to see here in this image, but if you take two or three meters uh, steps back, this would be much harder to see. You can see how it blends in. And in fact, if you ever see adders in heather, uh, it can be very, very difficult to spot them sometimes. This mosaic basking is typical of um, snakes and lizards to some extent too. And we've got adders here but this is exactly where you would expect to find uh, reptiles basking if you were in an area like this, the edge of the habitat. So you've got some shorter grass here, but you've got that longer scrub in the back and you know exactly where they're gonna go should you disturb them. Should you disturb these adders, they're just gonna slither off into that undergrowth and you won't be able to follow them. But give it five or 10 minutes and they'll probably be back. So if you do disturb a reptile, always make sure if you want to see it, that is, to just wait five or 10 minutes, and it'll probably come back. You know exactly where that common lizard's gonna run when it's disturbed. It's got a nice hidey hole here to disperse into. And if you are around water areas, do keep an eye out for grass snakes in the water, particularly in that second peak of activity, activity uh, so September, October, you, you might find them actively hunting amphibians and they'll do so in ponds. But around water is where you're most likely to find grass snakes. And I think, yep, yeah, this is where I got up to uh, before I skipped all the survey stuff. Um, but do, when you are doing your visual surveys, if you, if you can, uh, send your data to Dragon Finder, that's fantastic. If you would prefer to use iRecord, um, I actually use iNaturalist. Uh, the most important thing is that this data is going somewhere um, and it's being collated and hopefully it's being, it's being used. Um, so, yeah, that brings us, brings us to the end. So thank you all for joining thank us. Thank you. It's been thank an you absolute very much pleasure indeed, to deliver this.